Hey guys, it's Cynthia, and welcome back to my studio. Last week, I walked you through the entire planning process in reworking this Alice in Wonderland piece that I did back in 2007, and I had said this was going to be two parts, but I ended up actually losing a couple evenings to work for my day job this week, and it became slightly too ambitious a painting to finish in just a couple evenings, so I got it to about 80%, and instead of not posting today or putting out completely half-baked content or something I didn't care about, I made the decision to split this into three parts instead of two. So this is still gonna be part two, but in today's video, I'm gonna give you kind of a broad overview of the steps in my typical digital painting workflow, and then we'll get to the finish and some of the other technical detail stuff next week. And if you haven't watched part one, I do recommend going back and doing that first, just so you have some context for what I'm gonna be working on today, but I'll put a link to that video down in the description box. Throughout the video, I'll also try to call out some of the differences between my traditional and digital process, starting with my brushes, because in this case, it's just a brush. Like I just used one brush for the entire painting. And this brush is meant to resemble a mark made by a traditional paintbrush, but it has a really interesting dynamic because it has both a hard edge and a soft edge on opposite sides. And the edge side actually changes depending on which direction I make my brush stroke. So it gives me a really nice texture at every size and I really have a lot of control over how I handle my edges with it. I love this brush, so I'm permanently renaming it based on an inspiring comment from my last video. So I'm going to be working at about 18 by 12 inches at 600 dpi as my resolution. And instead of starting with a completely blank canvas, what I did was enlarged my thumbnail from the last video and ran a levels pass on it to sort of compress the value range into a narrower like gray surface that I could then sketch into. And when you think of a sketch, the first thing that probably comes to mind is line work, like when you sketch with a pencil into a sketchbook. And don't get me wrong, line is a perfectly fine way to start, but my personal tendency is to alternate between using line and value. And it kind of depends on the part of the piece and what kind of edges that I want or the level of detail that I'm shooting for at final, that, that's what kind of dictates which I lean on. So one of the reasons that my finished work ends up looking the way it does is because I build my digital paintings up in layers. Like mine isn't a paint by number kind of process. So every single bit of what you're seeing on the screen right now is eventually gonna be completely covered up. In some places it'll be covered multiple times by different layers of paint. And each of those layers kind of has its own individual purpose. The purpose of this layer being to sort of refine my shapes and coerce my thumbnail into being a tighter roadmap that'll guide me into the next steps. Once I've refined my thumbnail into a tighter value sketch, I'm gonna do my first color pass and I'm gonna do it on a multiply layer. So again, it's good that I dropped out some of those darker shadows initially. And we're still just laying the foundation here. Like I really only care about two things at this point. And the first is defining that I have warm shadows and cool highlights. And that's gonna be my scheme throughout the whole piece. So I'm gonna try to work that out now. And the second is defining strong areas of local color. Local color is the base color of an object. It's kind of the, the color that we refer to a thing as, like Alice's dress is blue, or the background of a playing card is white. And we say that even though in the final painting, there have to be lots of different hues on top of those base colors. But the reason that I lay this ground first is so that I have something to sample into. So every time you see that little ring pop up on the screen, that's me hitting the option key while I'm using my brush, and that's triggering the eyedropper tool. So what it is is I'm grabbing an adjacent color from within my image to keep working with. And that means I don't have to like truck it over to the color picker every time I need a different shade because I kind of already have my palette built into my canvas this way. 
And this is also one of those places where my traditional and digital processes really diverge because in a traditional piece, I would be mixing color off to the side on my palette and then loading up my brush and then trying to use that loaded brush all around the image wherever I need that color. But here, I'm working on different sections at a given time and I'm probably kind of zoomed in sometimes, so unifying my palette early on at this step helps keep a level of consistency across the whole image with color. The next step is gonna be a first detail pass to continue refining important areas, but with color this time. So on the queen's face, for example, I know I've got some hard cast shadows and I want more specific detail. So this is one of the few places I decided to use tighter line. And so I did a line sketch on a multiply layer to use as a guide in this one isolated area. And then I started painting, like first on a layer beneath the line and then over top of it. So this is where the digital painting process kind of starts to feel more like oil as I start going over that area. But again, with the main difference being how I pick my color. I'm using my reference photo off to the side, but I'm really only looking at it as a guide for the lighting and some of the placement of the features. Like I'm taking some liberties with the color to keep it consistent with the surroundings and exaggerating some of the features for an older and more bitter looking queen. So this is a pretty good example of how I use photo reference and illustration in general. As I started to refine Alice, I ended up only needing a little bit of line for her arms and I, I ended up not using any line for her face or her dress because I just already had enough information there. And the goal with her face was to take lighting information from the new reference I shot, but also look at shape cues from the original piece and sort of merge them together. So again, it's not an exact copy of either reference image, but sort of an amalgamation of both from this new angle. And in the early steps, I talked about how I eventually cover up everything at least once with paint. And we're finally starting to get to that by painting at full opacity in this first detail layer. And, you know, because I'm starting to get tighter with my detail, I'm beginning to work more zoomed in. And the zoom function is both a blessing and a curse for digital painters because it gives us an infinite range of detail frequency, but it can also make us completely lose touch with the big picture very fast, especially if we zoom in too much too often. So I try to combat that by doing what I call checking in with my piece. After any time I've been zoomed way in on a small area, I like to zoom way back out and look at the whole thing and just make mental notes of anything that's out of place or is no longer working within my value structure so I can correct for those things if I need to and make little changes. And again, that's a major difference from working traditionally where you can't make those kinds of changes midstream as easily. But here you have tools like Liquify, and even just selection and moving things around, you have so many little tools that you can use if you need to change anything at any point during the process. And speaking of things I can't do with traditional media, another tool in my digital toolbox is the ability to make global changes to my value and color structure. Like typically I do this more at the end, but really any time during the process it's necessary, I can use color balance or the levels tool or basically any of the tools in the image menu to make universal edits to things like color temperature or how deep my shadows are. And that can be really useful. So after all of that, I've still got a bunch of final details to sort out on the queen's costume and about a million playing cards to refine and add detail to. Like it's just a process at this point of figuring out how tight I want my detail to be in certain areas, like where my focus is and where I wanna leave it more loose and suggestive. So for example, I don't need to carefully define every little suit on every card in the background, the edges can even be a little chunky and that's totally okay because it gives them some personality and it's not the focus. 
Whereas with the foreground, I need to make sure everything is about as detailed as Alice is because they're at the same depth in space. And that means we're gonna see each of the little hearts on the cards and the card edges more clearly up where she is. And then slowly they'll get less refined as they go back in space toward the queen. And as we get to the queen's card, I'm basically just cueing off of her face and anything else in that, you know, depth of space to know how detailed I want to get with the rest of her. So that's about all I've got time to show you today, but I hope you'll join me for the surprise third part to the series next week. We'll get into some of the more nitty gritty technical stuff. Maybe I'll slow some things down. We'll see what works, but you know, I've said it before and there are many, many ways to make a painting, but I hope that some of this process that I'm showing you might speak to you or might work well for what you're trying to do or give you some kind of like little insight into something. At the very least, I hope that you got some inspiration to go work on your next painting. So thanks for watching guys. I really hope you enjoyed this. And as usual, I'm gonna go grab another cup of coffee and plan out my next video. And hopefully I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.